Hi, friends, and welcome to our webinar where Tom Dykstra is going to continue to dazzle us with his knowledge of entomology and insects and how they actually perceive their environment. You know, I've gotten so much positive feedback from these webinars where farmers have reached out to me and uh, expressed their appreciation for really understanding uh, some of the implications of what Tom is talking about, about how insects actually perceive their environment and what this means for developing the capacity to produce insect resistant plants, and insect resistant crops. And the topic for the webinar today reminds me of a book that I read many years ago titled Biochemical Individuality. And uh, this book describes how as a result of different nutritional balances and nutritional factors in our bodies, we perceive things differently. We taste things differently. We taste food differently. So um, my wife loves tomatoes and I intensely dislike tomatoes. And I'm confident that if tomatoes tasted to her like they do to me, she wouldn't eat any either. And there's a good reason, a good basis for that because of the way our body chemistry is different and the way that we interact with our environment differently. And the same concept also holds true for insects. And Tom is here to tell us all about it. All right. Well, thank you so much, John. It is uh, a pleasure to be here. Uh, for those of you who are aware, hopefully not tuning in for the first time, uh, because this is actually uh, the fourth of a four-part series that I am presenting on insect olfaction. It is my hope uh, that many, uh, hopefully most of you, have uh, listened to the first three, uh, get the necessary background that is necessary, because I am going to gloss over uh, some of those uh, facts and uh, focus in specifically on aphids, as I suggested at the end of part three, uh, where this was really going to be uh, my, uh, my single focus. And uh, so it is. So the title of today's talk, uh, Taste in Aphids, a chemoreceptive protein analysis. Uh, this is a, an analysis of the proteins uh, that I had talked about before. And uh, let us begin, okay. So as I mentioned, this is uh, the fourth of uh, four talks on insect olfaction. Presentation number one uh, was um, problems with the current theory of insect olfaction. I felt it necessary in order to discuss with you uh, the problems that do exist with how insect olfaction is perceived so that you would uh, understand uh, that it's not possible uh, for that theory to be, uh, to be a working theory. Uh, based upon uh, biophysical principles. And so therefore I need you to, to be open enough in order to listen to what we have on of course two, three and four. So on presentation two, uh, I moved in and started actually talking about the new theory of insect olfaction and how uh, it could work based upon uh, brief electromagnetic principles. And then after the introduction of that on presentation number three, I took those principles and I actually used it to start deciphering the insect olfactory codes of various insects. And I just chose a few because I didn't have a lot of time uh, to, to go through it. Uh, so that was the idea. So it was in presentation three that I spent some time talking about the software and the process and how I do it. So if you're not familiar uh, with presentation number three, uh, you might wanna go back and check that out. But in the meantime, I am going to forge ahead. So. Presentation number four, uh, I mentioned it was going to be on aphids, but why? Why aphids? Uh, the reason why is quite simply because I was asked to do it. I, I wanted to do aphids. I wanted to do this for several years, but when AEA specifically asked me to do something on aphids, uh, I jumped at the chance because I knew that this was going to give me a, a strong window into um, more details about how insect olfaction works. I had started the process already, it was back in 2016. I continued the process and uh, it has been um, a continual work in process as I continue to, uh, to work things out. And so I am also gonna mention briefly uh, the presentation on leaf bricks and insect herbivory, even though that's not part of the insect olfaction, I will be uh, talking uh, briefly about it. So I will pull in that presentation as well uh, here and there when I need it. Okay, 
Uh, I had uh, begun uh, that presentation with insects only feed upon food that is considered unfit, nutritionally poor, dead, or dying. This is true for insects uh, that are eating plants. This is what I'm discussing right now. I'm not talking about praying mantises. I'm not talking about uh, Apis mellifera, the honeybee, which is feeding on nectar. But for those that are feeding upon plants, this is the modus operandi. And so I had given this chart before. And in this chart, I had mentioned how uh, the if the, uh, the food is of a high enough uh, bricks level, leaf bricks level, there will be no insects and no disease, but anything below that, and you will get insects attacking it. But there are four different levels to that because everything is not the same. And it's this lowest group, the aphid group, that I wanna be talking about because the aphids are found on the lowest quality plants. Now the, the grasshoppers, the chewing insects and sucking insects, they're also interested in unhealthy plants, but the level of unhealth is what I'm differentiating here with this particular graph. So we're gonna go all the way down to aphids. And I just wanted to mention to you, uh, remind you really that the aphid group, which includes things like scales, uh, phylloxera, and, uh, and uh, some of the others in that group are, are pretty much leaving the plant at six to eight bricks, meaning they will be found at bricks levels below six to eight. But that is at the point where once you get to eight, aphids are all gone. And so it is this low level group that I want to discuss and give you a little bit of a window into why uh, they are going after unhealthy plants. Okay. I had mentioned briefly to you about the digestive system as being a part. Part of the reason is because aphids have a system where they're able to filter out uh, via the filter chamber, various um, uh, things that they take in, and they are able to expel them quickly. This allows them in order to do things that other insects are not able to do, such as the grasshoppers ahead. But I had mentioned this in a different talk, and I'm not going to spend too much time talking about it now, but I did want to remind you briefly that uh, this uh, is still in effect. So uh, if I'm going to be talking about aphids, where am I going with this? Because for those of you who may be aware, I'm sure most of you aren't, but there are over 5,000 species of aphids in the world. So this is not a small group. So when I said that I'm going to be covering aphids, uh, for those of you who are aware that there are over 5,000 species, you've got to be thinking, where is he going with this? And so obviously I'm not going to be covering 5,000 species of aphids. I can't cover that many, certainly within an hour, but I, I couldn't do it even if I, I wanted to try, even if you'd give me all the time in the world, because I am doing a chemoreceptive analysis, which means... I need the chemoreceptors annotated, which means I need the genomes. I need a complete genome of an aphid with all of the chemoreceptors annotated before I can do my analysis. And that is only known on 12 species. So I had 12 species that I can take a look at. Even 12 is a bit much. So I'm not gonna be focusing uh, on all of them, but here are just some representative aphids. Some of them are gonna be familiar. Uh, to some of you, some of them maybe not so, but I do want to focus on two of them. I want to focus on the pea aphid and the soybean aphid, and that will be my major focus, almost my exclusive focus uh, for this presentation, because the genome is known, the chemoreceptors have known, and I have an analysis that I'm very briefly going to introduce you to in order to give you a window into what these aphids are thinking, smelling, and tasting. So, why did I choose the pea aphid and the soybean aphid? In addition to having a complete genome, I, I, I chose two of them out of 12 because one of them is a specialist, the other is a generalist, and they're, they're big. These are some of the, the big aphids, uh, the big pests that are out there. So they're not uh, some of the obscure ones, and uh, there can be some obscure ones out there, but I, I think everybody knows what a, the soybean aphid is and the pea aphid as uh, being uh, two, uh, two of the head honchos. And because one of them is a specialist and the other is a generalist, in this comparison, I am able to compare the two against one another. And that allows me to, uh, to draw some conclusions that I would not have been able to draw if I had only done an analysis of one or the other. So that's the reason why I have two. So I'll be going back and forth between the pea aphid and the soybean aphid. Most of my discussion will be with the soybean aphid, the specialist, uh, but I will be bouncing off of the pea aphid when, uh, when necessary. So a little bit about the soybean aphid. Aphis glycinus is the uh, genus and species name. It's first described by Matsumera in 1917. 
So this aphid has been known since 1917 when it was first described. Obviously, it was around long before that, probably hundreds, if not thousands uh, of years before that. But it was simply first described in 1917. I, I need you to know that this insect has been in our world for a long time. That's important uh, for my discussion right now. Uh, it began as a minor pest in Asia. Uh, then uh, GMO soybean was introduced into the U.S. in 1996, and that is when we had our first appearance uh, of it. Soybean aphid, Aphis glycinus, was first discovered in the U.S. by farmers in 1999. It wasn't positively verified until July of 2000 in Wisconsin that, yes, Aphis glycinus has arrived, and it seems to uh, be causing a lot of trouble, uh, whereas it wasn't doing it before, but now it was causing a lot of trouble and farmers were looking for help as to why this pest suddenly appeared and why it was uh, ravaging their crops. So, well, they didn't have long to wait. By 2003, uh, just three years after uh, the verification in Wisconsin, the soybean aphid had been documented in Delaware, Georgia, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Kansas, Kentucky, Michigan, Minnesota, Mississippi, Missouri, Nebraska, New York, North Dakota, Ohio, Pennsylvania, South Dakota, Virginia, West Virginia, and of course, in the original Wisconsin. That's 20 states. We only have 50 in this country. And, and, and already in three years, it's spread to 20 different states, as reported by uh, Vanette and Ragsdale in 2004. So this is quite amazing that this thing just appeared out of nowhere and now is spreading like wildfire. It does kind of beg the question as to why did it suddenly appear and why is it going after soybean? Uh, what is the deal behind it? So today, just so you are aware, uh, between 92 to 94% of the soybean that is planted in the United States is genetically modified. This is an important pack, uh, fact for you to know. Uh, because these uh, GMO plants are uh, there and that there are very few soybean uh, plants that are planted, uh, maybe uh, six to eight percent at best, uh, that are not genetically modified. And that the soybean aphids are commonly found on the soybean plants and that these soybean plants where they're found on are usually measuring between three and six leaf bricks. This is bottom of the barrel. This is usually what you expect for the aphids because they'll start leaving the plants at six, seven, and eight. But usually I will find them uh, between three to six leaf bricks on a plant. This is rock bottom low. You cannot get much lower than that. I mean, one to two is lower, but you even plants even have difficulty standing up uh, once they're that low. So this is a low level plant. It's uh, not considered healthy and the aphids have been moving in and attacking them uh, with, uh, with great vigor uh, over the past uh, 20 uh, to 25 years. So where does this analysis begin? Uh, I'm going to uh, do a little chemoreceptive analysis and these are the chemoreceptors or the taste receptors of how they smell, how they taste. Uh, the ORs are generally thought to be considered the, uh, uh, the, the uh, smell receptors. And these would be keying in on things like pheromones and plant odorants that are being given off. Uh, you'll notice a large difference between the odorant receptors uh, between the P aphid and the soybean aphid. 87 of them, of the ORs and the P aphid, only 46 in the soybean aphid. Why is that? Because the ORs, as I said, are detecting some of the pheromones and the plant odorants. Well, uh, the P aphid goes after a lot of plants. It's a, it's a generalist. And so by that very nature, they're going to need an ability in order to recognize more of their environment. So it's really not surprising. As a matter of fact, this phenomenon that I'm showing you right now is very, very common in many insects. Anytime you have insects that are attacking a large variety of, uh, say, plants, it doesn't necessarily have to be plants, it applies to cockroaches too, then uh, you're going to have a lot of ORs because they're going to need to be able to smell everything. Soybean aphid is more of a specialist. Uh, with only 46 ORs. It specializes in soybean, as the name is um, suggestive of, but it also attacks uh, common buckthorn too. It's, it's one of its main hosts. There is another buckthorn plant that it attacks uh, though, but the common buckthorn is really one of the common ones. So it's really going after only two plants 
uh, the soybean aphid is. And so it doesn't need as many ORs. An interesting thing happens with the GRs, and these are considered the, the gustatory receptors. These are considered the taste receptors. So once the aphid tastes the plant, uh, they're then going to make an, a, a determination as to whether or not they want to eat it or not. And the number of GRs goes down in the P aphid from 87 to 78. There's a loss in the number of uh, uh, taste receptors from the ORs. That is a little bit indicative that taste is not considered to be as important as smell. But with the soybean aphid, the opposite occurs. It goes up. We have 46 ORs, but then we shoot up to 61 GRs, not as many as the P aphid still needs to be able to taste quite a bit because it's going after a larger number of plants, peas and lentils being uh, two of the biggest. But you can see that there's now a switch going on and that the number of GRs is a little bit closer than the ORs were. This is also very common among comparing specialists and generalists. And so we were able to back it up with the aphids. And I just wanted you all to know this happens with pretty much any insect that is out there. The number of IRs or ionotropic receptors, I'm not gonna be discussing during this presentation. There are 19 on, on each of them, but the total number of uh, receptors are 184 for the P aphid and only 126 for the soybean aphid. So in order to analyze these, uh, this is going back to the presentation number three. So what I have here, is these are actually some of the OR spectrums that I calculated for the soybean aphid. Now the soybean aphid only has 46 ORs and, and here I've only put 15 of them, but these are uh, 15 odorant receptors for the soybean aphid. I don't have the rest here due to space, but this kind of gives you an idea of what I've been looking at for the past six years. I'm sure a lot of you feel sorry for me, but uh, this, is, this is what I see all the time, a lot of black and white, uh, spectrums. Uh, things do get colorful though. I'll show you that in just a second. But when you're taking a look at these 46 spectrums, looking at them individually has a limited applicability to them. It's really become uh, much more interesting once you combine all of the gustatory receptors. And we were able to show that uh, before in, in uh, presentation number three, when I talked about combining the CO2 receptors, and we're able to play these games as well for the soybean aphids. So I can take all 46 of the odorant receptor spectrums and, um, and analyze them and get a common peak. So this is the common peak. So if you want, we wanted to know what aphis glycinus is smelling, there it is right there. That, that major peak right there is really what they are keying in on. There are two other peaks, which are uh, certainly more minor than the major peak, but they're big. Uh, because they're actually shown on this graph. Otherwise, the, anything that's not really, really common disappears from this particular analysis. And then we have two really, really small peaks. You can barely see them, uh, but there, there's a total of five peaks on this uh, spectrum. One big one, two medium-sized ones, and then two that are very, very tiny. And this is also another way to analyze them. In addition, I can bring all of the peaks together and analyze them by adding up all of their peaks and seeing which of the 46, uh, I'm sorry, which of the, uh, the, the odorant receptors, what are they really keying in on as a, as a group? So I can do the, uh, the major peak, which is on the top, and then I can take a look at all of the peaks on the bottom. So those are two different analyses that I can do. So let's start with the first uh, analysis, sugar detection in aphids. Fact, aphids feed on the phloem tissue, which is the superhighway system in plants that transports sugar. I'm guessing that most of you are aware of this fact already. And so the fact that aphids are feeding on the phloem tissue means that, you know, with a massive amount of sugar coming in would suggest that they are uh, detecting and tasting sugar. But you're going to need a little bit more than that because I got a question now. While feeding on the phloem tissue, do the aphids prefer sucrose, glucose, fructose, maybe galactose, maltose, or maybe some other sugar? You don't know. It, it'd be kind of nice to know because you can get these sugars in the phloem tissue. So that would be useful in order to know that. The second question is, do they prefer monosaccharides to disaccharides or vice versa? That would also be good to know as well. So to begin this analysis, uh, what I'm going to use, uh, I'm going to choose to use glucose as a standard. 
uh, because it is the standard sugar. And, and these standard peaks, these diagnostic peaks for sugars include 29, 20, 30, 30, and 9,900. These three peaks you can find in all sugars. So I'm going to be looking for these peaks just to make sure that I'm on the right track. And then once I find these three peaks, I would zero in on uh, exactly what sugar it may be keying in on. So I'm going to look for the 2920, the 3030, and the 9900 peak. Here is the first analysis. This is a composite graph of all of the gustatory receptors of the soybean aphid. There's an N of 61, if you remember. And I'm going to turn your attention over to the right side of the graph. Remember, I was looking for 2920. And you can see at about 2900, there is nothing. There's no major peak. Uh, there's no minor peak. At best, I'm getting a blip. So the first peak is not there. The first peak that I'm looking for for sugar is not there. Uh, but I continue the process. The next one I'm looking at, uh, this is now a far IR analysis of the soybean aphid. This is still the gustatory receptors. We're still at an N of 61, but we're now in the far R IR range. And I'm looking at the various peaks and I'm looking for 3030 at first. And the 3030 is tiny. It's way over here. It's not even labeled because uh, I didn't have room to label it. But that very small peak coming in at a height of about 30 is the 3030 peak. So it's small. Looks like they can taste sugar, but it certainly doesn't look dominant uh, as compared to some of the other peaks. So it doesn't look good. Uh, the 9900 peak, if I scoot over here and look between the 9480 and a 10,476 peak, it doesn't exist. So the 9900 peak also doesn't exist. Well, now I have two out of the three peaks, which are not here among uh, my analysis of the gustatory receptors, the taste receptors, where I would expect to find them. True, I do have one sugar peak, but it's small. So two are non-existent. One is small. Uh, things are not looking good. Uh, so I'm not impressed. However, I do know that aphids are known to feed on low bricks plants corresponding to low sugar. I just mentioned that earlier in a slide and that they're going after three to six bricks plants. So because they're going after low bricks plants, uh, maybe this is the part of the reason why it's not that important, or maybe they just need to detect low levels and it doesn't need to be that good. So let me take a look and do another analysis. I'm now going to bring in plant sap analysis, which is what we do here at AEA. I know uh, I think all of the consultants are listening in on this right now, but the sugar concentration in soybeans, and we're taking a look at the plant sap data, which is an extraction of the phloem and the xylem tissue, the superhighway system of the plant. It is not the entire uh, leaf that we're doing here. The leaf bricks readings that I did crush up everything. Whereas this is looking at the super highway, as I mentioned. And so because, of the, because you're only looking at part of the leaf, the BRICS readings are gonna be lower, certainly lower than the three to six that we look at. And uh, the reason why is because uh, it's not including, uh, for example, the sugar that could be found in the epidermal cells. It's not including the sugar found in the mesophyll cells, the spongy layer, it's not, getting any sugar, which could be in the, in the apoplast. Uh, so it's only looking at uh, the phloem and the xylem. And the ideal range as reported, uh, we're looking for a 1.1 to 1.8 bricks within the plant sap uh, data, within the phloem and the xylem tissue, the mean being 1.45 bricks. If we take a look at the actual data, uh, and I measured 741 samples, the actual data uh, for a soybean plant uh, for the plant sap data is 0.65 bricks. So this is severely lower. Um, I would prefer, as a matter of fact, I, I would prefer something above 1.8. Uh, I really would like to see something at three or four. Three or four bricks uh, for the phloem and the xylem is actually pretty good, but you can go higher. I've seen uh, six and sevens from that. Uh, it's certainly not going to get up to 14 bricks, but those are the leaf bricks readings, and I do want to differentiate that. But here we're sitting at about half a bricks for the soybean plants. So you can see we're dealing with low sugar. And this goes back to what I said before, how the uh, soybean aphid is going after low bricks plants. And here we now have further evidence that the sugar flowing around the phloem and the xylem tissue is also quite low, at least lower than, than it should be. So we've got additional evidence that the sugar is not that high. So if the aphids are known to feed on low bricks plants corresponding to low sugar, uh, what exactly is going on? Well, there's several things going on. There's still a massive sugar intake because these aphids, when they're putting their 
their mouth parts into the phloem tissue are taking in a massive amount of sugar, not because there's a lot of it, as I just mentioned, but because they're going to have their mouth parts in the leaf for an entire day, two days, three days. They can go on for a long period of time, constantly taking in uh, the, the phloem tissue, the intake. And so therefore a lot of sugar comes in, but most of that sugar is passed out the back end in the form of honeydew. So if any of you have ever parked the car underneath a tree with a lot of homopterous insects feeding, and then you're gone for a few hours and you come back and your car is just covered uh, with sticky dew, uh, that's because homopterous insects are in the tree and that they are feeding and they're just throwing out a lot of the sugar from their back end. They do not use the sugar. And that is interesting and kind of key too, because right now I have no choice but to tentatively conclude that aphids are not very good at detecting sugar. This almost sounds counterintuitive because they feed on phloem tissue, which is where the sugar is. And yet they also, based upon the fact that they're going after low bricks, we've got low bricks in the, in the uh, highway and that they can't even detect sugar, at least not in a very uh, significant way, uh, I have no other conclusion to draw right now, but this does beg the question then, why did I go through this? I mean, why, why did I show you that aphids don't seem to be interested in sugar? Exactly what are they interested in? And a lot of people who are watching this do know the answer to this already. And that is nitrogen. Nitrogen con concentration in soybeans. Now, if I take a look at the plant sap data, again, for soybeans, and I take a look specifically at the total nitrogen concentration in the soybeans, I see that the ideal range, I often give us ideal ranges, uh, are gonna be between 1589 and 1975 parts per million with a mean of 1782. So this is what you'd be looking for in a, in a soybean plant. This is the suggested ideal range that uh, you would expect, but the actual number is higher not surprisingly. So again, with 741 samples, the actual average is 2,049 parts per million. It's not much higher than the ideal range, but clearly it is. It's more, it's even higher if you consider it against the mean, the mean being 1782. So you can see that there's a significant increase in nitrogen in the soybean plant, and that quite possibly this is what the soybean aphid is keying in on right now. Or at least that's all the evidence uh, that has been uh, not only surmised in the past, but also in many of the scientific papers is that it is all about nitrogen. Well, if it's all about nitrogen, that also isn't really helping us too much because there's a lot of nitrogenous compounds out there. So which ones are we referring to? Well, we've got nitrates. That's a big one. Uh, we have nitrites, we have nitriles, we have ammonia, we have ammonium ions, we have amino acids, we've got polypeptides and proteins, we have amides and we have amines. So we've got a lot of nitrogenous compounds. So this isn't really going to help the analysis until we can zero in maybe on what they're going after, or maybe they're just going after all of them, but that's not even all of them because there's also uh, another list here from isocyanates all the way down to amine salts. All of these are nitrogenous compounds. They're not as common uh, as the ones on the left, but they're there. And they, you know, the aphid might be detecting these as well. Well, this, when you look at it, looks overwhelming uh, as to how to begin to start analyzing all of these nitrogenous compounds. So because it's overwhelming, there are a few different ways in order to quickly get uh, to uh, an answer. And so what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to look, uh, we're looking at the composite graph of the uh, soybean aphid. Uh, I showed it to you before. And uh, as you can see, I've got some major peaks that I want to zero in on I take a look to see if I can decipher what they are in order to give me a clue as to what the soybean aphid is, is tasting, because this is what the soybean aphid is tasting. It doesn't look like it, but I, I know that this is what's going on. So one of the first things that really draws your attention, uh, it does for me and it does for most people, are the three peaks that are off to uh, the right. It's not a big deal to deal with them, though, because they are quite simply water peaks. Uh, water peaks are the most common peak that I run into. With all of the analyses that I've done, with all the spectrums that I have looked at, water peaks are by far the most ubiquitous. You will find them because every insect in the world 
is has an interest in, in taking a sip of water or finding a high humid environment. And so uh, water receptors and water uh, uh, peaks are found all over the place. And here we are taking a look at three of them right now. So it's not something I want to focus on because we're not looking at the water. But I do need you to be aware that water peaks are there and everywhere. And they sometimes can get in the way and they do need to be sometimes filtered out. But that's not the biggest peak. Uh, the biggest peak clearly is the 10,476 peak. So let's take a look at that peak and uh, see what the deal is. Um, and here we have an ammonia infrared spectrum. So I'm interested right now, what do we have here? Well, I have three major regions of absorption in um, the infrared region for ammonia. Uh, the first one off to the left is not that big. It has a nice sharp peak though, somewhere around uh, you know, 3,300, 3,400. And then you've got a much bigger area right here, um, right around 1600, um, where there's a lot more absorption, especially the side peaks. But the thing that really dominates the graph is the one off to the right. One off to the right contains uh, two major peaks, uh, really a doublet peak. And those two major peaks, the doublet peak, also have additional absorption peaks off to the side. So there's a considerable amount of action going on in this particular uh, region. So. Because I've got a doublet peak right now, it's not really quite clear exactly, you know, do I want to look at one of them? Do I want to look at both right now? Uh, let's just look at the middle. So we've got two major peaks right next to one another. It's this peak uh, or this region that I want to focus on. And the midpoint of that region is right around, give or take, about 10,471 nanometers. So there is a uh, connection now that I have uh, between ammonia and uh, the major peak that the soybean aphid is keying in on right now. Uh, just to mention it real quick, there the other peak right here, the medium peak over here to the left, which is about 1600, uh, is coming in at just over 6100. And that almost coincides with the 6096 peak here. So, so I've got a potential two peaks uh, that are focusing on ammonia right now, two major peaks focusing on ammonia. One of them definitely looks like it's focusing on ammonia. The other one seems to be a little bit off. I'm going to bring up that peak again a little bit later. And so we have some preliminary evidence right now that it is ammonia that they're keying in on. Well, what about the soybean plant? Uh, we can take a look at the plant sap data. We have a massive amount of uh, data just in the soybeans. We've got uh, 741 that have been handed over me, to me to analyze. And I've taken a look at the minerals, elements, or various properties of the soybean plants, uh, according to the plant sap data. And um, almost all of them are within expected values. So molybdenum, boron, zinc, manganese, iron, silica, phosphorus, chloride, magnesium, calcium, potassium, as well as electrical conductivity and the pH are all within what we call as expected values. It might be a little high, might be a little low, but it's within that ideal range. So we're not, nothing is really uh, jumping out, at least from this group right now. If we take a look at the uh, mineral element properties um, of ones that do deviate from the expected values, we can see that aluminum is coming in at a 361% over what you would expect. Cobalt, 175% over what you'd expect. Copper is uh, 77, it's got 77% of what you would expect, meaning it's deficient. So it's actually a negative value and that's why I have it in red in parentheses. So the copper is deficient. Sulfur is 119% uh, um, of what you would expect. The total nitrogen uh, is 115%. So that's also high. We discussed that briefly. We've got some extra sodium going on in there probably from the high salt fertilizers or the high salt pesticides. Uh, and the sodium levels is not surprising are usually high. We've got 207%. And the total sugars, as I also discussed with you before, are also deficient. They're about 45% of what you would expect in the, um, uh, in the soybean plant. Uh, but what about ammonia? Ammonia is coming in at 2,356% over what we would expect to find. This is nowhere near. Um, anything else that I put up there, it's blowing aluminum away. Uh, and that was probably impressing some of you before, but the amount of ammonium in the soybean plant is uh, ridiculously high. So we now have even more evidence to show that it is indeed the ammonium, uh, the ammonium ions that the, um, 
the aphid is a keying anon. And just for those of you who like numbers, the ideal range for ammonium should be between 10 to 30 parts per million. Uh, our actual values are coming in at 471.1 uh, with our N of 741, well above the levels. And remember, this is the actual and the average value. I've got plenty of values over 2000 parts per million among the soybeans. So it does get higher. This is just the average of 471. As a matter of fact, not a single one of the soybean plants of the 741, not a single one was below 30 parts per million. So not a single one reached the ideal range, which is very unusual. Everything was above 30 and the average was 471. So this is potentially dangerous. Uh, if you can get up to you know, 2000 parts per million and beyond, uh, Nevin and Lovan in 1987 demonstrated that uh, toxicity uh, can occur. And so now you've got a toxic situation in the soybean plant, which means it's unhealthy. It's having difficulty regulating that and the plant is in trouble which helps to explain the low bricks readings as well as the uh, low sugar that is going on there. So uh, when you do have an ammonium situation, uh, the plant can step in and do its best in order to control the situation. Oftentimes with an ammonium, high levels of ammonium, uh, you will, uh, many of the plants will produce amine salts. They will convert the ammonia into an amine salt in order to uh, prevent the toxicity, which will revolt if that much ammonium is present in more of a free form. And these amine salts correspond to the 3557 and the 3325 peak. So we do now have evidence not only for ammonia, but we also have evidence that the plant possibly could be compensating uh, for this by producing some amine salts in order to help keep control, the control down so that it continues uh, to uh, grow. And obviously the, the situation is getting, uh, is getting more interesting. <laughs> uh, what is going on? Let's take a look at the plant sap data again. If we take a look at the plant sap data, I mentioned, you know, some of these are within normal parameters, within the desired range, within the ideal range, but they're not really. So if we take a look at boron, zinc, manganese, iron, silica, and molybdenum, they are within the desired range. Every single one of them is within the desired range, but every single one of them is on the low end of the range. Not quite deficient, just on the low end of the range. And so those six because they're low means the plant is also suffering. It is weakened and therefore a weakened plant is not going to be able to do what it's supposed to do, which is photosynthesis. That's uh, the, the goal of every plant. So we've got, I wouldn't call them deficiencies though, but we've got problems because we certainly don't have an excess. And it would be nice if we had a little bit more boron and a little bit more zinc, for example, uh, in our plant. Uh, an, an exception down here, as you can see, is copper. Copper didn't make it. It is truly deficient. It didn't reach the minimum of 1.16. I certainly would have liked 1.43. I would have liked uh, two parts per million would have been fine. I'd have been happy with that. That would have been uh, plenty of copper to keep the plant going, uh, but it's not. Uh, it's at 1.00 for the mean. And so we've got a situation right now. We've got low levels of some of these. And if you take a look at zinc and iron, for example, and manganese, they often exist. Um, in a plus two form. Copper is often found in a plus two form. These are divalent cations. And uh, for those of you who probably know where I'm going with this, um, if um, soybeans are 92 to 94% GMO, that means they're being sprayed by glyphosate and glyphosate removes divalent cations and it holds on to them and it chelates them. So shortages of zinc and manganese and iron and copper are not uncommon. Uh, when there is a massive amount of glyphosate, which is being sprayed because glyphosate is fantastic. Nothing chelates like glyphosate. It is much stronger than many of the other pesticides. Almost all of the pesticides are chelating to, to a, de, uh, a greater or lesser degree, but glyphosate uh, is the best. And so now we've got some shortages right now, and this does seem to be affecting the plant. Well, how is it affecting the plant? If I give you just a generalized overview of the nitrogen cycle in plants, it begins with elemental nitrogen, the nitrogen which is found in the atmosphere, and that is converted by, uh, in the soybean plant, it's going to be converted by rhizobia in the nitrogen nodules into ammonia. And then the ammonia will be converted into nitrites, and the nitrites will be converted into nitrates. Once we have the nitrates, 
which are often the form that fertilizers are placed into because we've skipped several steps. The nitrates can then be turned into uh, amino acids and the amino acids then in turn form the actual proteins, the complete proteins, which we're looking um, and that are indicative of a healthy plant. So uh, in order to get from one step to the other, you're often going to need some of these, uh, these cofactors, these uh, minerals that we just discussed. So cobalt, you can't go from elemental nitrogen to ammonia without cobalt. Cobalt is required of rhizobia, and it's also required of the uh, two other major types of um, um, nitrogen-fixing ba bacteria. So the ones that can be found in the soil, the free-living ones, as well as the endophytes that are not part of the... Uh, nitrogen nodules, they're all using cobalt. So you need cobalt in order to make ammonia. Otherwise, you're going to have deficiencies. And we've been able to show that, but that's a story for a, a, different, uh, a different time. Now, to get from ammonia to the nitrites, you're going to need copper and you're going to need iron. I just mentioned that iron was at very low levels, but not quite deficient. And I just mentioned that copper is actually at deficient levels. So if you don't have enough copper and iron, and we don't, in the soybean plant, then you're going to have some difficulty converting the ammonia over to the nitrites. Therefore, it's really not surprising that we have an ammonia sink. If the ammonia is being produced by the rhizobia, and we do have enough cobalt, an ammonia sink could develop if it is not able to be quickly converted into the nitrites, which then are converted into the, the, to the nitrates, which are more stable. And so we're going to have a plug so to speak. And this plug could cause an ammonia uh, to, to build up to possibly 471 parts per million, uh, because that is what we have observed. So this is a possible scenario and a possible problem that we have uh, with uh, the soybean plants, as well as the, uh, the soybean aphid just taking advantage of it. Uh, manganese, nothing is, is chelated more by glyphosate than manganese. Uh, manganese gets first dibs. It will go after manganese before it goes even after copper or iron. So manganese, it's, it's good to take a look at the manganese levels and you kind of like to see what's going on. And because I had just mentioned that we've got ammonium problems in the plant, I've got a graph here taking a look at the high, uh, the, the low to the high levels of ammonium in a plant and looking to see what happens with the manganese. And then we can see that there's a relationship there. As the ammonium levels increase, to dangerous levels, we're now hitting 2,000 parts per million or higher, you can see that the manganese levels are low, too low. They're below the acceptable range that we should find in a soybean plant, which is between you know roughly about uh, 7 to 13 parts per million. Um, but not only do we have deficient amounts here, but take a look, even at the first figure, when the ammonium levels are below 100, which doesn't sound that bad, we still don't have excess in manganese. We've got a manganese problem. It would be nice to have uh, manganese levels above the acceptable range to start because then as the plant starts to use them, there is a possibility that they could get used and sometimes chelation occurs. I get that, but we're not even starting uh, with an excess. We're starting with something which is a little high in the acceptable range and then quickly falls off as ammonium levels increase. This is more of an indication that we're dealing with a problem. The plant is suffering. The ammonium is a problem. It's an inverse relationship here as ammonium increases. Manganese is decreasing. And so uh, this is something that you know many of the AEA consultants need to be aware of. All right, let's switch gears a little bit, talk a little bit about sulfur. Uh, sulfur, uh, so I've got a number of proteins here, proteins that I've analyzed over the past uh, six years. And I've got the sensory neural membrane proteins, uh, 2B, which I talked about in the last presentation. Olfactory receptor 56, a bombix mori. I got a pheromone binding protein in Papilia japonica, which is the Japanese beetle. I've got the gustatory receptor two of Aedes aegypti. I've got an ionotropic receptor one of the India male moth, uh, Plodia interpunctella. So there's obviously a lot here. These are all proteins. And every single one of these letters is an amino acid. So some of these proteins are huge. The ionotropic receptors often boast 900 amino acids. These are big, big proteins. The amino acid itself is not a small molecule. It's composed of many uh, atoms already, but there is something which kind of connects them all. And that is they all begin with methionine. Methionine 
initiates virtually all of the proteins on planet Earth. It is only one of two amino acids, and there are 20 amino acids, sometimes uh, 21 to 22, depending upon how you want to count them, that have a sulfur atom. Methionine is one of them, and methionine begins all of them. So I think you can see here that if every protein is beginning with methionine, you need to have enough sulfur. Otherwise, proteins will not form correctly, and they will not. And you will then have fragments of proteins rather than the real proteins. So you need to make sure we have enough sulfur. Now, fortunately, we do have enough sulfur because we mentioned that before. We said that the sulfur is uh, slightly in, uh, in excess. So that's a good sign. But it goes beyond just methionine. It also goes to cysteine. Cysteine is the other amino acid that contains um, the sulfur atom. And the cysteines are important too because of the cysteine bridges. These proteins, you can see I've got a, a representative protein off to the left and it looks incredibly convoluted and complex. That's because it is convoluted and complex. And all of this twisting and something going on, the alpha sheets, the beta sheets, the twisting and the turning all based upon electrostatic interactions, et cetera, et cetera, is based upon in part how the amino acids are arranged and then they actually form bonds in order to solidify this complex shape. And so it will fold back upon itself and then rebond to itself. These are called cysteine bridges. So here off to the right, I've got a demonstration of amino acids all in a row. And the cysteine bridges are being connected to one another through these sulfur bridges. This, these cysteine bridges help form a complete protein and allow it to form in exactly the way it is supposed to be formed. And so that's what you're looking at right there. So cysteine is absolutely relevant to a complete protein. Methionine is absolutely relevant to a complete protein. So we need sulfur. And if you're going to be completing a lot of proteins, and the aphids are making a lot of proteins because they're uh, producing young at, at a very rapid rate. They're the only insects, the only animals on planet Earth that are born pregnant. Uh, so they can really uh, produce young very, very quickly. And they are going to need sulfur. So the ideal range for sulfur and the plant sap data is between 151 and 199 parts per million in soybeans. And not surprisingly, uh, we do have an excess. We have an excess. So the soybean aphid is going to be looking for an excess of sulfur. If it doesn't have that, it's not going to be able to produce the proteins in the way that it should, and it will suffer and it will not be able to produce young. So we do have an excess of, of uh, sulfur in there. It's not a huge excess though, but it's definitely an excess. And that's what the uh, aphid is going to be uh, looking for. So what's the deal with sulfur? Well, sulfur has a very well-known peak. Uh, the most common peak is at 2550 wave numbers, which corresponds to about 3920 on this. And if we take a look at the P aphid right now, the P aphid does have a 3900 peak. It's a little off because it should be around 3920. So this one's at 3965. It's suggestive of the fact that the P aphid may be able to uh, key in on, on sulfur and therefore the sulfur compounds that are out there. And so it should be able to possibly taste it. However, if we go to the soybean aphid, it's not there. The 3,900 peak really doesn't exist. Uh, you can see that's a little small one right there, but it's not very big uh, as it was in the, uh, in the P aphid. Um, and even though the P aphid might've been a little bit off, it just doesn't exist at all. And so this would seem to suggest that the soybean aphid cannot detect sulfur and that maybe the P aphid can. But for those of you who are involved in spectroscopy, you know that there, there are more than one peaks uh, in order to play with. So I want to focus your attention on 7408. The reason why I want to focus on this is it's an interesting peak because there's nothing before it and there's nothing after it. It kind of sticks out. So other peaks often have you know peaks close by. This one does not. So the 7408 peak is sticking out and there's really nothing uh, on either side of it going from practically 6,000 to 9,000. So so what's the deal with the 7408 peak? What does it correspond to, if anything? Well, it corresponds to four sulfur compounds. It corresponds to sulfonates, sulfonamides, sulfonic acid, and sulfones. So I put that star there to show that there actually is uh, a possible um, uh, ability to detect or taste these four sulfur compounds. There are two down here that it doesn't correspond to as well, the sulfates and the sulfonyl chlorides, 
where the peak is a little bit off, uh, 7,000 to 7,200, which is a little bit off of the 7,400. And so I would simply declare those as being negative. They wouldn't be able to detect those. So uh, clearly there is the possibility that sulfur could be detected uh, by the soybean aphid by a back door rather than that common 2550 wave number peak of 3920 that I discussed. But the sulfate issue is interesting too, because the sulfate also has several peaks. I'm just talking about one peak right now, but the sulfates are the usual sulfur compound that are found in uh, uh, moving around um, uh, insects and plants and that type of stuff. And so if you take a look at the uh, other sulfate uh, compounds, we do run across two more. The 9480 and the 11,650 do correspond to sulfate compounds according to Cabassi et al. in 1978. And so we've got the possibility right now with the 7408. We've also now got the possibility of the 9480 peak contributing. And we've now got a third possibility of the 11,650 peak also contributing to sulfur detection. So we've got three possible peaks. I wouldn't call them smoking guns right now, but it is interesting that they are there and that there is this correspondence because the soybean aphid does seem to be possibly working through a back door in order to detect sulfur compounds, which are important uh, for its life. So uh, let's take a look at these peaks again on the P aphid. I had already mentioned that there was the 3965 peak and that maybe the P aphid does taste sulfur. But if the assumption that the 9480 and 11,671 peaks are associated with some type of sulfur peak, specifically a sulfate, you can see that the 9480 peak is actually two and a half times higher than it is in the soybean aphid. The 11,670 peak is also two and a half times higher than it is in the soybean aphid. Uh, of note, you can see that the ammonia peak has dropped considerably. Um, it's now halfway, I guess you could say, in between the 9480, but the 11,671. But it may not be detecting ammonia as well as the soybean aphid, though, but it looks like it can detect it. And now it looks like we possibly have an elevated response to sulfur. And if you take a look at the plants that the pea aphid attacks, peas, lentils, and the others that they attack, do they have high levels of sulfur in them? Not only do they have high levels of sulfur in them, but they also have high levels of sulfur sometime in the reproductive parts of these plants as well, which are sometimes gone after by the P aphids. So this is suggestive information right now, but it is possible uh, that the P aphid, that we're able to zero in on possible sulfur receptors. You can see it has a decrease in the 7407 right now, uh, but these two have gone up. And this is sometimes how it works uh, with insects. Uh, there are back doors in order to smell things and uh, sometimes peaks can uh, take the form of, uh, of, of deciphering, um, sorry, not just one odorant, but even two odorants. Alrighty, so along those lines, if we take a look at the IR spectra of proteins, and I don't expect any of you to do this, they are incredibly complex. So proteins have a highly complex IR spectra. And just look at them. I mean, look at how convoluted and twisted they are and the massive number of atoms that they have. So Wang et al. in 2005 will you know, talk about how complex these things are and how it's difficult to see almost anything in them. There are some indicative peaks, though. And it even gets to be even more complicated because there's a 1999 paper showing that complex proteins can even adjust the already existing absorption frequencies to a higher frequency. So that just makes me throw up my hands in disgust, thinking, wow, this is way too complicated. I can't really, really deal with this right now. And this is, this is a complete protein. A complete protein is a complex protein. But what is an incomplete protein? Well, an incomplete protein has less amino acids, a lot less amino acids. So I've got an amino acid one and amino acid two, just two imaginary hypothetical amino acids. And you bring them together and you form a peptide bond between them. And that's how amino acids come together in order to, fa um, to, to form these complex monstrosities that you see over, over to the left. Well, the peptide bond is indicative of this, of putting proteins together. This peptide bond is uh, difficult to see with in the complex spectra that we have over here. But the peptide bond is relatively easy to uh, see. If you're dealing with a dipeptide, which has only two amino acids, a tripeptide, 
which has three amino acids and therefore two peptide bonds, as well as even a pentapeptide, which has five amino acids and therefore four peptide bonds. And so to see the peptide bond is going to be a little bit easier when you're dealing with broken proteins. And so what is the major frequency for the, the peptide bond, which you're not going to be able to see in a complex, but you can see in a simple one. Well, that comes in at 6098, 6098 uh, nanometers. And that just coincides quite nicely uh, with the 6096 protein that we have. So even though uh, a, a single peak, which is uh, very high in the soybean aphid, could be detecting ammonia, as I suggested earlier on, because it's very close to the 6100, uh, it could also be detecting the peptide bond. The peptide bonds are indicative of broken proteins. I had mentioned in some of my previous talks that insects like broken proteins. They cannot digest and they cannot handle complete proteins. Now we have some preliminary evidence to show that a broken protein via the peptide bond, which is going to be much more visible and discernible uh, if they're broken rather than being in a complete protein, is almost exactly uh, what you'd find 6098 versus 6096. And so there's now some evidence right now that the uh, soybean aphid can detect the peptide bond, which for our purposes, certainly as an AEA consultant, is suggestive of the fact that uh, they are de now detecting broken proteins in a plant. And this also helps to explain why the soybean aphid is going after low BRICS plants. So, and uh, so let me just uh, do the calcium real quick. Uh, calcium, uh, the normal range, uh, plant sap data, 1600 to 3300. In the young leaves, it's at 1300, which is deficient with an N of 456. In the old leaves, it's not deficient, but it's not that high. It's at 2295. Certainly like to have something at 3000 or even beyond that would be nice. And that's in an N of 353. Calcium is an aphid's enemy. Calcium has the ability to plug up the mouth parts of an aphid. There has come some complex biochemistry going on that the aphid is able to overcome. And one of that is to make sure that it sucks from a low calcium leaf. Aphids, for the most part, go after the young leaves, the flush, which is at the top. As we can see in soybean, the young leaves have far less calcium. 1300 compared to 2200 or even 2300 if we round it. And so there's a lot less calcium. And this is part of the reason why the aphids are going after the young leaves. They will move around and check out different leaves as the taste of the leaves changes. And some of them can move down to older leaves. But generally speaking, I think most of you are aware, especially if you're dealing with soybean or many of the other plants too, that soybean aphids and many other aphids like to go after the young, soft uh, shoots at the top, and that's where they congregate. And this is part of the reason why, is because calcium is not at a very high level uh, in these young leaves. But there's a little bit more to it than that. What if we superimposed uh, these young leaves and these old leaves and did an ammonium analysis? The ammonium analysis on the young leaves is averaging 562 parts per million. In the old leaves, it's only, only averaging 393.9 parts per million. So not only are they attracted to a low calcium, but they get extra ammonium ions to boot. This is just beautiful. It's like, you know, going to see your favorite movie and getting popcorn at the same time. So they've got the ability to, uh, um, uh, to go after the most succulent or the, the type of leaf that they wish to suck from. And these are all clues as to what the soybean aphid is doing. All right, and here's just a side-by-side -side comparison. I just wanted you to see sometimes what I have to see when I'm comparing soybean aphid and pea aphid. So um, as we can see, we've got a big drop in the ammonium, 1040 to 76 to the pea aphid. I mentioned that there's an increase uh, in the possible sulfur frequencies on each side. Uh, you can see that some of the peaks do line up uh, quite well with one another, not surprisingly. Uh, and sometimes they don't. So the water peaks that are over here in the pea aphid are different than some of the water peaks that we find up here. Uh, and that we do have some peaks that line up with one another and some that do not. So there are all these different peaks. I haven't got a chance to talk about everything during this presentation, but this kind of gives you an idea 
of uh, how you, you can compare two insects, especially if they're going after different plants. And part of my job is in order to discern this and uh, get this information, uh, especially to our AEA consultants. So final comments. Aphids are known to attack Lobrix plants. Uh, Lobrix plants contain incomplete proteins and aphids appear acutely tuned to the incomplete proteins through the recognition of the peptide bond. Aphids are known to be attracted to excess nitrogen in plants and excess nitrogen was found in the plant sap data. Aphid chemoreceptors are tuned to the predominant peak in ammonia. Ammonia is found in large concentration in the soybean aphid's favorite plant, which of course is soybean. Uh, the absorption peaks 3920, 7408, 9480, 11,670 are suggestive of various sulfur compounds. It's something that I would like to look into further. There are some aphids, for example, that only attack brassicas, uh, which are extremely high in sulfur. So taking a look at aphids that only attack brassicas would help elucidate some of these uh, frequencies right here and would help uh, us to un understand uh, how the aphid specifically smells and tastes sulfur. Uh, deficient levels of calcium are found in plant parts where the aphids prefer to feed, such as the new flush, and copper deficiencies in soybean may lead to these ammonia sinks. So these are just some of the final comments that I just wanted to tie everything together in. I want to thank you for paying attention uh, to uh, this final presentation of insect olfaction. I understand that there are a lot of things that are left unsaid. Uh, this is part of the reason why when AEA approached me about doing the presentation, uh, I said, I I'm going to need to I'm going to need to proceed this with some other presentations before they even follow what I'm talking about with the aphids. So thank you uh, for those of you who stuck with me through all these four presentations. I'm looking forward to uh, uh, more analyses in, uh, in, uh, in the future. And as a matter of fact, I've already started analyzing uh, the newest one as of recent. And uh, I'm sure there'll be more presentations in the future to be had. Thank you once again for uh, listening. And at this time, I'm now going to uh, turn it over to John. Thank you, Tom, for uh, twisting our minds as usual and uh, giving us lots to think about. So thank you for that. There's been a couple of questions that have come through. Um, Tom, I think we're just going to take this straight to you if you're able to. Um, the first question is from Tom Willey. Do you have any experience working with Bavaria as an endophyte for cabbage aphids or for aphids in general? Um, it's not specifically related to the insect olfaction. So I'm not sure if it's an insect olfaction question or whether or not this is just about relating Bouveria bassiana with the cabbage aphids. So the question is not absolutely perfectly clear to me. Uh, I do not have a lot of experience with Bouveria bassiana. So I have not looked into that as much in regards to the, uh, the cabbage aphid. And so I don't have any pertinent data to share with you. I simply have the background knowledge that most entomologists have in regards to, uh, to this relationship. So I, I'm sorry about that. Thanks, Tom. One of the pieces I'll comment on, not specifically to this organism and this interaction, but we've observed that as plant health improves and as the quote unquote pests like the aphids disappear, then the quote unquote beneficials populations also tend to drop because they have less of a food source to feed on. So um, don't have any specific experience with Bavaria, but something to think about. Okay, um, that's good. Question from Eugene, Tom, how can I get rid of aphids? I control aphids with molasses followed by potassium. So should I be using calcium? Um, test. Uh, I don't know. Are you deficient in calcium? If you test uh, <laughs> yes. and you find out that you are deficient in calcium, yeah, you need calcium. Cal is calcium important for uh, the aphid? Sure. It, it, uh, uh, they don't like the calcium. As I said, it can plug them up. It hardens uh, the uh, plant cuticle. It's hard for them to puncture. Uh, sure, sure. Absolutely. Increasing calcium can help um, uh, with your aphid problem, but it would be good to test because I would want to make sure that the calcium isn't being tied up uh, and that you, you have a true deficiency. Uh, but uh, uh, like I said, I think testing is important here rather than guessing. Thank you, Tom. That's, uh, as you said, why would we guess about anything that we can test? That's why we have SAP analysis. That's why we and, have it. Uh, there's a follow-up question here from Jim. What minerals might be essential? Uh, we, we talk about this in um, 
some of the clips that we've put out, Tom mentioned sulfur and ammonium and the minerals, the elements that are important for ammonium regulation. So it's, uh, you, can, you can surmise which elements are going to be important. But the bottom line, again, is use an analysis, measure what isn't in balance and try to get it balanced and you'll see these problems fade away. That is correct. Uh, there's a follow-up question here from Raphael. Are other sucking insects functioning the same way? And he offers uh, a couple of uh, examples yeah. here that I'm hesitant to try to pronounce. Okay. Uh, yes and no. Uh, the, the insects that do act the same way are the homopterous insects. So there's a group, uh, they used to have their own order status. The hemiptera have now been combined with the homoptera. But those who are in the suborder homoptera are, do have this, uh, uh, the same ability that the aphids have. And so there's a strong similarity between a lot of these homopterous insects. So uh, some of the homopterous insects, uh, leaf hoppers, are, are one of the more common ones. I think a farmer would be familiar with, and they are. They have some strong similarities with the aphids because they have a filter chamber, uh, and the same thing. But the other sucking insects that they're not going to be as closely related to are include uh, the thrips, it include um, uh, stink bugs, and things of that sort. They're going to have a slightly different system. They're going to be a slightly higher uh, than uh, the aphid group, and so the answer is yes. They are similar to other sucking insects, but no, they're not similar to all other sucking insects. And that's the, why, the reason why I separated them on that chart at the beginning of the presentation, is to differentiate between what I can see right now is two different groups of sucking insects. Over time, maybe before I get too old, uh, I'll be able to, to break it into a third and a fourth level. But right now, uh, I've only been able to break it apart into uh, four levels at this time. All right. Well, thank you, Tom. And thank you to everyone for participating and for listening, for asking questions. We really enjoy the interaction. Uh, I'm for sure you found the information stimulating. And I would ask that you also share the webinars that Tom has done with other people. Uh, try to get the word out there. This is obviously, as you understand, very revolutionary work that Tom is describing and um, offers a different perception to what's going on and interacting with plants, very powerful information. So Tom, thank you for sharing. Thank you all for being here and uh, we'll see you all again in the future. Have an awesome day. Thanks everyone. All right, thank you. Bye-bye now.